Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. I am your host, Patrick McFarlane, and this is episode 42. It is also the first installment of the Liberation Library book reviews, and uh, you can find the show notes for this episode at libertyweekly.net forward slash 42. This is my top five recommendations, uh, book recommendations for the novice libertarian. And uh, this is the first episode of the podcast that is also available as a YouTube video, so you can see my talking head. Uh, but I will also be, you know, holding up the books and stuff. Uh, all the books that I mentioned in this episode will be listed in Amazon affiliate links in the show notes page, so that you can um, go check out the books on Amazon, pick them up, and correspondingly also help out what I do here at the show. We can call it mutually beneficial exchange, so to speak. Um, I do have a few announcements at the end of the show, so be sure to stick around there. Uh, but I'm just really excited to kick off, you know, with the webcam and all that stuff. Uh, it's been a very challenging platform, actually. I've had a lot of trouble um, doing takes in the videos, so uh, I hope that you'll forgive me if I come off a little awkward doing this all in one take. Uh, but I'm sure it's something that will get better with practice. So, um, all right, so without further ado, I'm just going to kick off the book review here. So the first book that I have will be a little controversial of a pick, uh, but the first book is Rousseau's Social Contract. <laughs> just kidding. That's not the first pick. You throw that in the trash where it belongs. So the real first pick is perhaps the antithesis of the social contract. It is, uh, unsurprisingly, Frederick Bastiat's The Law. Um, this is my fee edition. I picked it up for free somewhere. Um, but I also have a more detailed edition, which is um, Politi Political Economy by Frederick Bastiat. It's just a collection of his writings here. Um, oddly enough, or unsurprisingly, it's also published by fee. Uh, but, I mean, this is the quintessential first pick. You know, if you if you ask anyone... Um, this, you probably should start with The Law by Frederick Bastiat. Uh, Ron Paul has recommended Frederick Bastiat a whole bunch. Uh, you learn the difference between the political means for acquiring wealth and the, um, which is, you know, extortion or theft, and the private means of acquiring wealth, which is satisfying, you know, the demands of others in a mutually beneficial exchange. So there's also the broken window fallacy in here. Um, but I know for sure that you can pick up a free copy from Fee, or you can go on Amazon and pick up Political Economy, uh, which is what I've read from, and I, I really, I really like it. It's a good collection. Uh, but I, I should preface this by saying that this is not, although the first pick is probably everyone's first pick, this is not an objective like, you know, everyone should read the top five books. This is not objective. This is my subjective list. They just happen to correspond with the objective list. But these are the books that I actually read on my way to becoming an ANCAP or a voluntarist. So I think that they'll help you out. Maybe I'm a little biased. Um, but so in that first pick, you get the Frederick Bastiat. It's essential reading. You know, if you're an ANCAP or a libertarian, I think even Minarchists will pick this one up. Uh, just essential here. But so my second pick is Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And this is the first pick on everyone's list as well. So, but it, it really is, it, it teaches you that in order, so the main lesson, the one lesson is that in evaluating any given economic policy, you have to analyze its effect on the entire economy and not just in one sector. And uh, you also get the, the seen and the unseen uh, which I forgot to mention is also a big part of Bastiat's lesson, is uh, the seen effects of a given policy and the unseen effects. And so Hazlitt brings it to a bit more of a modern sense. I mean, the lesson is timeless, uh, but Hazlitt brings it into a modern sense and tackles it issue by issue. And uh, so it's just quintessential reading. It opened my eyes to a lot of different policies. And I, I kind of wanted to explore this a little bit by saying one thing I always mention in law school and annoy people during discussions is that I always feel like the problem with the state is that we're always chasing after the effects of a given policy. And we're 
we're never chasing after the actual root cause of a given policy. And uh, honestly, it's been eh, like a year and a half since I've read economics in one lesson. Uh, but I think that, that that is also kind of a point uh, that Hazlitt makes is that we need to, you know, be tackling the causes of these policies and not just the effects, kind of like cha a dog chasing its tail, if you will. Um, so kind of cruising along here. I'm only at five minutes. That's probably a good thing. So my next pick is Anatomy of the State uh, by Murray Rothbard. And this is available for free. I think the law is also available for free online at FEE or also Mises. Uh, the Mises Institute, Mises.org. So I'll put I'll put the links in the show notes page, but I'll also put my Amazon affiliate links so you can hook me up there. Sorry for that mic pop. But okay, Anatomy of the State blew my freaking mind the first time that I read it. Um, also blowing my mind was Stefan Molyneux's The History of Your Enslavement, which is in a very similar vein uh, to Anatomy of the State. So essential reading once again it's it's probably your best introduction to rothbard and his ideas uh it's just great and i've cited it in papers in law school and that's always a fun time <laughs> so um yeah so one, one of the major quotes here i think i'll read it is franz oppenheimer on page 15 of my edition um rothbard quotes him in the state there are two fundamentally opposed means whereby man, requiring sustenance, is impelled to obtain the necessary means for satisfying his desires. These are work and robbery, one's own labor and the forcible appropriation of the labor of others. I propose in the following discussion to call one's own labor and the equivalent exchange of one's own labor for the labor of others the, quote, economic means for the satisfaction of need, while the unrequited unrequited ap appropriation of the labor of others will be called the political means. The state is an organ organization of the political means. No state, therefore, can come into being until the economic means has created a definite number of objects for the satisfaction of needs, which objects may be taken away or appropriated by warlike robbery. So, you in through that Franz Oppenheimer quote, you kind of get the whole Bastiat idea too of the political means of acquiring wealth and the economic means of doing so. So, and I also forgot to mention that as I'm presenting the books in the order that I would suggest someone read them, and um, kind of the purpose of this list too is not to like wake someone up because I think you can't just shove a book in someone's face to wake them up unless they're open to the knowledge. But these would be my books if someone came to me and asked me, oh, what is this an ancapism or what is this voluntarism thing? I would say, oh, well, all right. <laughs> you, you might be sorry you asked, but here's a stack of books to read. So, um, so there's Anatomy of the State. And my next pick actually and this is, this is probably kind of uh, going off the beaten path of the objective list. Uh, my next book is von Mises' Bureaucracy. And I think it, the reason I picked this one is because it has within it the socialist calculation problem. And uh, it's a short read, as you can see. It's not too thick, so it's not onerous. Uh, like I know that some of... It's been said that some of Mises' writings has been onerous because, I mean, hang on a sec. You have an human action. I almost said anatomy of the state again. You have human action, and it's translated from the original German. And German can be a little bit cumbersome just because of the translation to English. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, people are familiar with human action. But it's a, it's a pretty thick work. And I got a few tabs in it, if you can see there. But um, this would be, I don't know, number seven or eight. I said five books, but you can't just pin me down to five books. Okay, so I, I've also cited bureaucracy a whole bunch. And it just really lays out the socialist economic calculation problem. And if you ever want to make a solid argument why the government is not good at doing what it does this is your go-to right here although in it Mises kind of taught he he kind of is like well you know we need the state to provide for pub like 
police and stuff like injustice and stuff like that, uh, which I don't think is true necessarily. Sorry, my computer just went to sleep for a second. So this is a great book, a great introduction to the socialist calculation problem. Alrighty, so next on my list is The Mystery of Banking. And this is by Rothbard. I don't know if you can, there we go. Got it in for the camera there. So the second edition, there's a foreword by Joseph Salerno, who is a prolific scholar at the Mises Institute currently. And uh, this is published by the Mises Institute. And this is one of my favorite all-time books. This is a great book. It teaches you about how money expansion happens. Well, so I'll to go through the contents. Let's see here. Crack this sucker open. So the contents here, you know, you get money. It teaches you about money, what makes good money, why gold makes the best money, and um, its emergence throughout history. Then it goes to what determines prices, supply and demand, money and overall prices, uh, and, and it details the supply and demand for money itself, an important concept here. The supply of money, uh, what, what is fiat money, and then how, I think in the beginning, within the history of money itself, it goes into like different ways that the state has controlled the money in in history and how it started with coin clipping and then it evolved into you know they needed money to fund their expansive wars so they created central banking um and then it, it details the money expansion process through lending and that's something that i had no idea about they don't teach you that in school um just kind of blew my mind reading this book and i think that it is a really good intermediate introduction to libertarianism and sound money principles because you get i mean you get the 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 hard the quick hard hitters initially earlier in my list you know anatomy of the state economics in one lesson the very introductory stuff but i think that this is a good intermediary and then it really it, towards the end it gets into the fed in the history of the fed and uh just in my opinion such an indispensable book here so I would definitely pick it up. I, I will link to the Amazon affiliate link, but I'll also link to Mises. And it does not bother me at all if you'd rather buy from Mises. In fact, I would do that myself. And um, so I lost track of how many books I've recommended here because I just love, obviously I love books. But this is a library book. But this is if you want to get into the the um, the unexplored, kind not unexplored but there isn't a whole lot of substantive material on how law would work without the state and bruce l benson's book the enterprise of law this is indispensable everyone should read this every ancap should read this this will answer every question that you need that you, or excuse me every question that you have and every question that you need to know in order to defend the system because for a lot of ancaps and voluntarists and part of my show is i guess trying to dispense with this uh one rough spot always is oh well how would law work how would you know jailing work or would there be jailing you know that's a big question and uh, bruce benson goes through the history of non-state legal systems in here and i've kind of I've kind of touched on it a little bit uh, in the podcast, although I haven't had as much time recently to do substantive episodes on you know legal theory because I've been so busy with class. And to be honest, I've been scripting out the episodes and it just becomes way too, it's like writing an extra paper per week, like an extra five page, not double spaced paper per week. So it becomes quite onerous, but I nonetheless, I like to do it because I think it's very important um, to kind of elaborate that and have popular libertarian media on the law and how the law would work. Um, but I, I'll list in the show notes page. I'm not remembering the episode number where I talked about non-state uh, justice systems. I've also talked about Lysander Spooner and his work on the podcast before so i'll link those in the show notes page uh they're some of my most popular episodes which makes me warm and fuzzy on the inside <laughs> and um 
I, I wish I could do more of them, but just I'm in finals right now, so it's not really going to work. Although I do have a domestic violence paper where I talked about, you know, why we should get rid of the state and why the state and why domestic violence is actually a very good area to start if you're going to start abolishing the state because domestic violence could be solved, I propose in the paper, through private security firms that will take up restraining orders and in fact a lot in my paper i talk about castle rock v gonzalez or it's gonzalez v castle rock which is a colorado case where a woman had a restraining order against her estranged husband and the husband showed up and she called the police the the husband showed up and abducted the children from the front yard and she called the police knowing that he probably took the kids and she called the police all throughout the night and the police refused to do anything to enforce the restraining order. The court order that she had had obtained, you know, through the the court and the police department is supposed to come and protect her. And so just infuriating set of facts in this case. And this lady, this poor lady, she called several times um, the police department. They said, oh, well, just wait a couple hours, you know, and until the estranged husband called her. And said, hey, I have the children. I'm at a this amusement park. And then so she called the police department again and said, hey, I have a restraining order against my husband or an order for protection. He has my children. He's abducted them and he is at this amusement park. Will you please go check or put out a public service announcement so that they can, you know, get back to me? I can get my children back. And they said, oh, no, there's nothing we can do. Literally nothing we can do. And long story short she goes to the police department and all throughout the night several times she called like six times finally she goes to the police department physically and the deputy there is like oh well i'm not doing anything about it and he goes off to to eat so then at 1 a.m in the morning the estranged husband shows up to the police station gets in a shootout with police effectively commits suicide via cop and the children are dead in the truck three 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 little girls murdered and um essentially the supreme court opinion ruled that there is no property interest uh in the enforcement of a restraining order so basically this poor lady was shit out of luck because you know there the supreme court has ruled that there's no property interest in a restraining order so she can't sue there's governmental immunity um but the Supreme Court did limit it to saying that there's no property interest that they can find through the 14th Amendment. So the Supreme Court is not going to order a property interest in, in the duty taken by the police department to enforce the restraining order. The Supreme Court did say in the opinion that the states were free to create this duty themselves. Uh, but to my knowledge, and I did some research on this, there aren't many states that have this rule. And um, backing up, you know, what we, our point in the dissent in this case, Ruth Bader Ginsburg of all people says that there is an enforceable property right if the woman had contracted with a private security firm to protect her from her estranged husband. So if it were a private contract to protect her, she could sue. But just because the government undertook it, because they have a monopoly on these things, there, there is no relief for her at least through the 14th Amendment. Um, you know, and then you get into um, Warren v. D.C. or, no, Warren v. District of Columbia, yeah. And um, I thought that this was a joke or that, because, you know, you hear a lot of voluntarists that will talk about how in Warren v. District of Columbia, the police have no duty to protect individuals. And I was like, nah, that can't be right. And I, I didn't actually look at the opinion. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically what the opinion says, that absent any kind of special duty, the police do not owe a specific duty to protect you as an individual. They only owe the duty to the public at large. So even if you call the police and say, hey, they're, and this happened in the case, you call the police and say, hey, there are people invading my house. They're going to rape and torture me. Well, in the case, that's what happened. And the police showed up and 
they knocked on the door and didn't do anything else to investigate the crime while the people who called 911 were being raped and tortured in, in the house. And essentially, Warren v. District of Columbia ruled that they could not collect. There was no enforce, you know, there was no duty there. There were no damages. Um, infuriating. And uh, they, although it was only an appellate court decision, but and uh, I could I could cite the language. I'm going to prepare a scripted episode for this uh, to go more in depth. But essentially, they could cite the language. I could cite the language where they say that this is a well-established rule. And um, I have so much more to say about that. But essentially, it, it makes sense why, and I've said this quite a few times, uh, it makes sense why we would not require a general duty like an individual duty because if the states or if the government if the state found a duty there a duty for police to protect individuals absent a special duty being undertaken a special relationship the the state would be so swamped with litigation that they would i mean taxpayers would be paying out the ass because they're so bad at doing what they do and um, I, I'll get into that. I have, I'm working on this paper for my domestic violence class. My professor is thrilled about it, which is really cool. And um, because she's not, you know, an ANCAP or anything. Uh, but I'm encouraged by her excitement for it. And I think when I'm at school, I automatically assume that because all my, you know, all our, our ideas are so radical. I assume that my professors would be hostile, but a lot of them are actually like, wow, this is the outside of the box thinking that we're looking for because, I mean, a lot of the liberals at my university know that there's a problem with the system. I think they're more open to the idea that there is a fundamental, like, base problem with the system, and they're because of that, they're open-minded, and I can't knock them for that. And so I've only been greeted with open-mindedness there and not from students, but <laughs> from professors. And so that's encouraging. I mean, there's still a little, uh, you know, PC and they favor the state or state solutions, but at least my professors that I've dealt with have been open-minded to out-of-the-box solutions. And that is super encouraging. And uh, I think it helps that that I have such a solid wealth of information at my fingertips when it comes to, you know, all the theories, Rothbard, uh, you know, I've cited, like I said, a lot of the books that I reviewed here, I've cited in the paper, and uh, we'll see that as it comes out here. Um, so yeah, that, that includes, I think, my introductory book selections. Uh, I really appreciate you checking out this episode. I'm excited to have my first uh, video podcast episode. Uh, that's exciting. So I'm going to go through a few announcements here. Uh, first, I I am jacked because I have uh, more Patreon support now. I've been able to pick up this webcam that you're viewing this podcast through. Um, I have kind of pledged that any of the, I mean, this is kind of common sense, but any Patreon support that I get is either going to go towards upgrading my equipment or directly towards paying my hosting fees or my operating costs. And... I think that's kind of a no-brainer here, but this is it in action. This is, um, you know, fostering independent media, I guess you could say. And I don't say that to be grandiose because I think everyone should have their own podcast. And we'll be talking about, I have an episode planned for that too. Uh, but if you, moreover, if you really, really want to help out the show, I would say you should share it. slash Amazon, and it will take you right to the Amazon page at no cost to you, no additional cost to you, and you can just do your normal shopping, and it will go to help support the show as well. And um, just as I'm closing here, I got a few upcoming appearances. My next guest is scheduled to be at the show. 
My next guest is scheduled to be on the show. I'm doing an interview with him Friday night, and that is uh, Chandlin Hudson, and he has a YouTube channel called The Defenders of Liberty Podcast. And so I'm excited to get on with him. Uh, You know, it's always good to talk to new people. Also, I'm going to be appearing on the Don't Waste Your Hate Podcast with Daniel from the Actual Anarchy Podcast. And I think Robert is joining us too. I'm not really sure, but I'm excited to get on the Don't Waste Your Hate podcast uh, with Tony. I've been talking to Tony a lot, and we're doing good work with the Libertarian Union, uh, which is a collection of libertarian podcasters that I would highly recommend at libertarianunion.com. We are also on Facebook. So I'll include those links in the show notes page. I really appreciate I really appreciate you uh, checking out the video podcast. If you're a YouTube listener, uh, I have iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music links for you to subscribe uh, there as well. So thanks again. Peace out.